Okay, welcome back. Um, we've got a really exciting session ahead, and it's a topic that many of you have raised about um, improving the extent to which we raise standards and, and standardize within the industry. Um, we've got a very cool panel over here, and uh, I think you're gonna really like the session. And to introduce the session, I'm very delighted to um, introduce Josiah Choms from Caverton, another one of our absolutely wonderful board members who's always supporting our work so heavily. And so come on up, Josiah. Uh, thank you, Gretchen. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to this session on standardization. Uh, thank you to so many of you who have dedicated time and energy to be part of what we're trying to do for the industry. Uh, when I took my present role at Caverton, that's five years now, one of the things that I discovered was we're a fast-growing organization, a very tiny company, being inundated with a lot of work, and so, of course, we had to recruit from all around the world, all kinds of people. That brought some value, but that also brought some baggage. Um, we found rather quickly that uh, people had different ideas of how to operate in the oil and gas sector, and the company was being pulled in all kinds of directions. So I asked for an audit to be done. I brought uh, an independent company from outside of the, the continent, in fact, to do a survey of our people. One of the questions was on safety. What do you think safety is? And a uh, very interesting range of answers. Someone said safety is um, an unachievable dream. Another one said we could be the safest company in the whole wide world. That was the range. And so to get a, a handle around this, we developed something we call CRILS, C-R-I-L-S. And, and so we comply, we, we, we report the good, the bad, the ugly, we intervene at any level of the organization, anybody can stop work. We learn, the moment we stop learning, we, we fail to, to, to become an organism that exists. And then we share, we share all the things we know internally and externally. And with that framework, which is very consistent with what we're doing here at LA Offshore, we discovered that the company began to make a step change uh, where everybody could key into some fundamental things along. So I know it is possible to have a common standard that everybody can key into uh, when there's a commitment uh, to doing so. I use that to introduce our topic on standardization today and the distinguished panel that will be helping us think through how that can help us improve all the ongoing work on um, airline and aviation management guidelines, if you like and to ensure that that is implemented across board consistently, and hopefully to help us, all of us, to key in behind some key standards that we collectively have selected uh, to be the key priority areas for us. So without much ado, I am very honored to introduce Duncan, Duncan Trapp. Duncan has been with CSC since 2007. He started as a flight safety officer comes with a range of background in the Royal Air Force, flight, flight engineer, or navigator rather, and uh, flying on, on fighter jets and then of course uh, some helicopters like Pumas and Chinooks. Grew through the ranks in, in the European sector of CHC to his current role now and as the Vice President of Safety and Quality, looking not only at operational excellence in, in, the, in the group, but also in their world-renowned Heli, Heli-1 MRO. I'll be visiting that very soon after this trip, in fact. So he brings a lot of experience, more than 27 years of, of doing this sort of work. And so we're very delighted to have Duncan. And of course, we have Jonathan Phillips, with Shell Aircraft, as the Director of Air Transport. He too comes with a lot of experience, over 30 years. Uh, flying as a pilot, as a manager, and as an aviation specialist. In fact, he is the man to go to for when you come to technical standards and, and excellence in, in his company, and that has been transmitted through the IOGP to the industry as a whole. Then we have uh, Mr. David Anderson. 
he comes perhaps one of the furthest trips uh, to, to, to join us here from Australia. Uh, he, he has been with Flight Safety Foundation. He too has nearly 40 decades of, of, of experience in aviation as a commercial pilot, a flight engineer, a Royal Air, a Australian Air Force background. He has also been in an international airline and all of that. But last uh, few years, or spread that, last eight years has been focused in the BAS program. For those of you who don't know BAS is, that is the basic aviation rig standards of uh, the Flight Safety Foundation in, in, in Australia. And so that is the kind of people that would help us think through in the next few minutes and hours uh, on, on how standardi standardization of all the things we're doing in Heli Osho can, can actually help us in, in achieving safety in excellence. So without much ado, please help me welcome, to start with, Duncan. Thank you very much, Josiah. So, flight engineer, I've been called worse, but I, uh, but I am, in fact, a navigator. Um, I'm going to navigate us through the next uh, 60 minutes. So we're taking you up to lunch uh, with uh, Jonathan and David. Um, we were quite excited to be called cool. I think we've redefined cool. Um, uh, we were also quite excited, or David was excited. He said, great, we get to walk on to David Bowie. We can be heroes. We thought, yeah, that's cool. And then Jonathan said, yeah, but just for one day, and it brought us crashing back down to reality. So thanks for being the leveler, Jonathan. Um, it is going to be interactive, so I'll just remind you, if you've, uh, if you've switched off your poly EV, uh, then please get it prepped again, because later on in the session, we will have a, an opportunity for you to, uh, to provide input. In fact, we actively encourage you to provide input. There'll be a discussion session and some, uh, some polling going on. So be prepared uh, to live up to the birthplace of democracy as we are in Athens. In terms of overview and what we're going to cover today, uh, we've got uh, an industry view uh, on the value of standardization and raising standards that's going to be effectively brought to you via video. Um, and then we've got an OEM perspective. I've, I've found a willing volunteer uh, in the audience to stand up and give us uh, a very short uh, input on what the OEMs think about standardization and whether it causes challenges. Then we go on to, uh, to Jonathan with his IOGP hat on. Uh, and then followed up by David with, uh, with some of his data-driven uh, demonstration of value of standards. Uh, so that's the plan. Um, but uh, to, to start with, I mentioned the video, and we asked some of the, uh, the, the smartest and, and, dare I say, most attractive people in the industry, uh, their views on standardization and standards and the benefits that they bring to uh, enhancing safety excellence. And the results are going to be shown on the, the video that we'll play now. Every day around the world, helicopters are safely moving thousands of workers to and from offshore installations. This happens thanks to our industry's relentless focus on achieving excellence in safety performance. It means not settling for minimum standards and dedicating ourselves to working together in pursuit of continuous improvement. We absolutely cannot take it for granted that these aircraft are safe, or safe enough. We're gonna do everything we can to completely eliminate incidents and fatalities in our industry. And we have to do that with a lot of diligence and teamwork, sharing best practices, and focusing on the areas where we see the greatest risk. The business case for, for safety and actually eliminating incidents and fatalities from our business is because it's the human thing to do. It really, in my view, bi the business impact comes secondary to the human responsibility that we have to make sure people return home safely every single day. What's really important to me is the passenger experience. That the passengers that get on board our aircraft every day around the world, around the globe, feel that they are safe and cared for in each and every flight, that they can get on board aircraft and go to sleep just as they would on any airline flight around the globe. We want to focus our efforts in those areas that have the most potential to save lives.
Over 90% of accidents and serious incidents in offshore helicopter transport are due to three main causes. And those causes are the reliability of safety critical systems, the um, avoidance of obstacles, the surface or the water, and flight path management issues. And if we can tackle those three issues, we can make significant enhancements in safety in our industry. Our industry's response to the goal of safety excellence is based on working together to create solutions in those areas that matter most for safety. As solutions emerge, we want to give as many people as possible in our industry the opportunity to benefit from our shared knowledge. We have two key tools to achieve this. Firstly, collaboration around a common set of safety standards. And secondly, proving the value proposition for these by showing why they matter, that they're worth doing, and then verifying that they are making a difference. To make real progress on safety, there's some tried and tested methods that we can use. We can learn from what's happened in the commercial fixed wing industry, where they've used collaboration, data, and a strategic focus on those areas that matter most. And once those areas are identified, which we have done in our industry, we really look at what are those actions that are going to have the greatest effect and allow us to achieve excellence where it counts to saving lives. Together, we can share data, we can collaborate, we can make sure we've got the right investment of resources, people, and expertise to deliver on those actions and to measure that we've got the results that we need in the global front line. We can also then put those things into standards that can be used to ensure that we get consistently good results across the world. Heli Offshore's members have quickly proven that the journey to excellence is much more productive and cost effective when we take it together through collaborative work. And it is also a big plus to be able to clearly demonstrate to everyone just what we stand to gain in our organizations and for our industry from the measures we are taking. Teamwork means everything to us because we're able to share best practices that way and we all know that it's, it's a one plus one equals three game. We've got to get people to open up and share what they've learned in a certain environment to, to, with people that haven't learned that yet. That's the way the collaborative approach works and that's why it's so successful because we're able to get to the, what I call the holy grail, the best practice in each particular uh, area. When you come up with a new idea, it's always a, a test to ask yourself, well, is this the best idea? And uh, did I think everything through? Well, when you use a collaborative effort to come up with the best practice or a standard, you're, you're far more assured of it. It's still not 100%, but you're far more assured of it, that it has universal acceptance. And, and to sell that idea inside an organization or across organizations is so much easier. And we find that that's true. I mean, we are part of the HUMS Best Practice Group. Uh, we participating in Helidex uh, and search and rescue groups. And I think uh, hopefully we give as much as we get, but we certainly get a lot out of it as well. It makes a big difference to be able to clearly demonstrate to everyone what each of our top priority solutions will deliver. Take helicopter terrain awareness and warning systems, for instance. How can we make the value case for investing in these? The H-Tools program is really going to benefit um, saving lives on the front line. And we know this through the research and development we've done and the data that we've got. We know that potentially it could have saved up to 42 lives by giving the pilots advanced notification and advanced warning, and in some cases up to 30 seconds. So we know there's going to be a direct uh, result uh, on the front line with us. And getting everyone involved in defining the right standards has been proven to create an environment in which safety excellence can thrive. If you have standards, you're more likely to get it implemented on the front line, both from the oil companies who are supporting the standards by creating standardization, and by the helicopter operators. Having standards is one thing, but, and it would be excellent to have that, but boy, is it really important to have it implemented on the front line, which we know the standards will drive that implementation. The problem if we don't have consistent standards across our industry is that we will be perpetuating a uh, situation that's been uh, going on for many, many years where staff are having to deal with differences in aircraft type, aircraft specifications, or deal with differences in operational expectations that have been expressed in the contracts that oil and gas companies have with their suppliers. I think 
Uh, this can sometimes be a safety issue, it's definitely an inefficiency, and uh, it can lead uh, uh, to some confusion, uh, and that confusion can often be a, a precursor or a contributor to safety incidents, uh, and we've seen examples of that across the years. Oil companies are promoting the positive change that comes from safety standards. They are leading industry work to develop and implement standards to drive safety performance. IOGP members doing the work within our work group to define new recommended practices and then use those recommended practices in our contracts will allow helicopter operators uh, and suppliers to be able to provide that consistent service and to eliminate that distraction at the front line. Heli Offshore member companies are collaborating to develop solutions to help pilots use automation effectively and manage their flight paths. Flight crew operating manuals and approach path management guidelines are great examples of this. A critical area of development is the development of flight crew operating manuals, or FCOM. This is the vehicle we're going to use so our pilots and our crews understand truly how the manufacturer of the aircraft designed for it to be operated safely, particularly with reference to the automated systems on board. The development of our approach path management guidelines means that we've got collaborative safety information in one place to ensure that our crews can fly safe, consistent approaches under all environmental conditions. We've achieved a lot through collaborative effort in developing areas of these standards but that'll all go to waste if we don't consistently implement these standards across our industry. Our experience has proven that excellence can be contagious when we're all pulling together in the same direction. Early Offshore is pretty much part of our business and just like a company has a business plan or an operational plan, so we have a safety plan and Early Offshore fits nicely in there because it's unlikely that the uh, very smart and eager people at Cougar Helicopters are going to come up with all the solutions. And we need to be part of a community. And in this instance, it's a safety community, a community that will work towards uh, making sure that we have no accidents and no injuries and so on. And I believe that that's where the intelligence is going to come from. We're going to share all the things we uh, learn, um, the protection measures we use. And that's something that we can gather from other people or actually also put into the pool of knowledge. That helps us being a safer organization. Our shared mission is that no lives are lost through offshore helicopter flights. We achieve this by sharing information to prevent accidents. And entering best practice is used by the global front line. Our combined activities provide cost benefits to members. Our collective action delivers breakthroughs in safety performance so that those working offshore come home safe to their loved ones. We have fail every day. I told you they were a glamorous bunch, didn't I? They didn't disappoint. I was actually interviewed for that, in, uh, that video and I didn't make the final edit, but I'm not bitter or twisted. <laughs> I'm just pleased Francois made it and Tim Rolfe made it, that's fine. But anyway, I get to run this gig. So, we have uh, an OEM's perspective and, uh, and really the question was, I guess for an OEM who operates on a, um, a global stage, is it possible to standardize and, um, and provide something that's understood by all worldwide uh, without impinging on the commercial side. And there's an example here that, uh, that was kind of given to me about stop signs across the globe. And ultimately, you don't have to be able to read the local language. You know that that's a stop sign. And so that's positively enhancing safety by a common approach to signage and uh, interpretation communication. Likewise, if you look at a standard uh, for sockets, a myriad, the standards are the same and the solution can be different, but at the end of the day, uh, there are many, many solutions. So to, to choose the voice of the people, and Alan Walling has been recognized previously as the voice of the people, so he keeps that title for, uh, for this presentation as well. Really the question, Alan, is to you, as a representative of an OEM, does standardization give you challenges um, in your industry, and if so, are they insurmountable? Uh, hey, look, there's a microphone on my table. So I'll uh, get a chance to use it. Uh, thanks, Duncan. You know, from, a, from an OEM's per perspective on standardization or standards, 
uh, we're very familiar with that, right? So, you know, the regulations, part, you know, part 29 helicopters is, uh, you know, what we're operating here. That sets the guidelines for us, right? Here's, like, basically the minimums that you have to meet or the performance capability that you have to achieve. Where the innovation comes in from an OEM's perspective is how do we get there? So, you know, the regulations say, hey, you must be able to have this type of capability, but it doesn't tell you how you have to get there. So all of us, all OEMs, what we do is we, our innovation comes from how can we achieve that standard or that regulation? How can we exceed those requirements? And what's the innovation and the talent that we bring uh, in order to uh, make it, you know, to those levels. So, you know, I did, I supplied, you know, I showed Duncan uh, these <laughs> two pictures, you know, the other day. And uh, like he said, you know, you got the stop sign where you have one standard, it's all the same, but how you promote that is, uh, is pretty different. But then on the, on the right-hand side of that chart, you have standards that are, in, you know, done individually. So it takes a collection of both of those uh, in order to get to where we are uh, today with how we innovate, how we meet regulations, how we meet standards, uh, and that's really how we look at it from an OEM perspective. Thanks, Alan. So we're talking about standards and standardization, and obviously there is a subtle difference between the two standards, uh, setting the framework, if you like, and standardization, all being, being all about rather compliance uh, and consistent uh, compliance uh, or promoting that uh, uh, standard to be the one. Um, we've talked about regulations. Um, there are regulators in the, uh, in the room who quite rightly say, well, we give you some uh, standards to work to because we regulate the industry to a, an extreme, not an extreme, but certainly to an extensive um, degree. And the regulations do provide a baseline. But quite often, for all the reasons that we understand, the, the bar is relatively low in terms of regulatory requirements. Uh, and we need to raise that standard uh, and raise the bar t together. We also know that the regulators do differ, so uh, EASA might have a different regulation or a different approach on uh, something from uh, Transport Canada, from FAA, from CASA, ANAC, etc. So there isn't commonality, global standardization, when it comes to regulations, even when they start to converge as they, ha as they are. Uh, and we also know that helicopters do, as a fact of life, in my view, lag the fixed wing world when it comes to standards uh, and standardization. So we, we have to play catch up in, in many cases. Uh, and so this is the perfect forum to do it. Uh, Bill mentioned yesterday um, the, the JOR and, uh, and the, the sort of the genesis, if you like, of Halley Offshore back in 2013 after a number of events and, and incidents and accidents across the globe. And, and when we came and sat down together, we kind of shared our frustrations of the differences that we saw in our industry. And it's fair to say we would go back to the oil and gas companies and say, there are too many differences. It's causing safety issues, whether it's directly or, or indirectly from efficiencies. We weren't brilliant at articulating it. It was very difficult to get our arms around it. And so we said, there are too many differences. And they quite rightly said, well, tell us what they are. And we didn't quite hit the nail on the head. We had a bit of a run up at it. We got Andy Evans in, who's far smarter than uh, the folks that started uh, uh, the effort. And, uh, and we got a bit closer. But um, I think there was a general acceptance after a while that the differences did exist, and that's leading on to some of the work that Jonathan's going to come to. Um, in terms of uh, further work required, I've just put a couple of points in there, really, just to say that it, it's probably never-ending. Now, whether that's good for job security in the future for us all, uh, that, that might be a positive. But uh, we're always introducing new technology. Drones are coming in, uh, and quite rightly, we've seen the proliferation of drones and their use within the industry. Um, and it's unavoidable and actually a positive thing. But we have to think through how we're going to introduce drones into the aviation environment because we're mixing drones and helicopters. And if we don't do that in a standard way and have standardized procedures, we're potentially introducing safety conflict. So now would be a good time to get at that rather than wait until it's uncontainable uh, and then try and figure out how to fix it because effectively that's what we're doing with other areas. Lithium batteries are another area as well. IATA provides standards in terms of regulation on what can and cannot be carried, but it's designed for fixed wing. Fixed wing have cabin crew and a myriad of equipment to fight fires if these things do overheat and go in fire. Uh, we don't. Uh, and at the moment, we haven't got a common uh, standardized approach to lithium batteries and the carriage of spare lithium batteries. And we've seen from a recent heli offshore info share that these things can and do ignite. And if that happens in flight in a cabin of one of our aircraft, then we've got problems. So let's get around the table and, and figure out the best way to deal with it as an industry. 
And that's the challenge that's been given to Jonathan in terms of creating uh, some uh, standards or some recommended practices uh, for uh, IOGP. This is how I define it. It's a symphony. And there's a process, which I'm not going to go into on the right-hand side, as to how you create a standard. Uh, but it's all about consensus, and it's not easy. And in their view, this is ISO's view, from first proposal to final publication, it can take about three years, so it ain't quick either. But there are ways of accelerating that. And I'll now hand over to the maestro, who is in charge of the IOGP um, uh, recommended practices group, and, uh, and he's going to tell us the work that they've been doing and how they're going to achieve uh, what we're all desperately keen to achieve. Jonathan. Thank you, Duncan, and uh, I'm not usually called the maestro, and I'm also conscious as we uh, get ourselves ready for uh, a run to lunch that a session on rulemaking is not necessarily the best thing to whet your appetite, but I really enjoyed in that video the, uh, the level of enthusiasm and energy there was around this topic, because in my view uh, uh, and in my years of association with this industry, I think it's uh, a long overdue piece of very important housekeeping that I think we're all capable of doing, we need to do, and once we've done it, we're going to reap some really uh, valuable benefits. Uh, earlier on, we had uh, Chris Hawkes and Tony Crampup speaking uh, for IOGP. So I've got uh, a couple of things I want to say about why, IOG why IOGP is central in this role uh, and central in this recommended practice activity, uh, but also how that interacts with Heli Offshore and the operator members to make sure we get the, uh, the right uh, choices made with uh, new documents we're producing. So to start with, uh, I'll click through that one. IOGP, it's uh, the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. Uh, it uh, leads with many of the, uh, the world's publicly traded, privately owned, uh, and publicly owned, and state-owned companies. Uh, its footprint is very large. Uh, so uh, uh, in this instance, we're talking about uh, companies that are operating in all of the geographies that Heli Offshore uh, exists in. So really, this is your, the, the client community represented through one body. Now, IOGP, as Chris mentioned this morning, is a, uh, uh, a membership organization, and the structure of that is a management committee. You heard them refer to it earlier there on the top bar, that management committee uh, are very senior uh, executives in the oil and gas companies, uh, and uh, they have a very clear view and agenda about what the IOGP needs to achieve within that, standardization and simplification uh, are, are a really strong theme. Uh, for, um, for us, for our area, aviation, it forms part of the safety committee. Its, its focus is entirely on safety. And uh, the safety committee uh, collects data, uh, operates, uh, again, with very senior people from the oil and gas companies. Uh, and it has a, a key strategic uh, project underway called Safira. Uh, again, I think that was referred to earlier this morning. Safira, since it's built uh, uh, like uh, Heli Offshore's work in uh, uh, the safety performance model on analyzing data, Safira is focused on fatality reduction, uh, and three things stood out across all of the risk categories uh, in the oil and gas uh, industry, process safety events, aviation, and land transport. So there are active projects underway, underway within each of those three thematic areas. Uh, and the JIP that uh, Tony and Chris mentioned this morning falls within Safira. But what I wanted to say here is, so does this standardization work that I'm about to brief you on now. And although it's a, uh, uh, more of a housekeeping activity, we already were able to prove back to the safety committee and the management committee that there's value here, uh, and that um, uh, by investing in getting common industry standards, uh, there would be a safety and a fatality reduction benefit. So, some of those other areas of standardization, global life-saving rules between all the oil and gas companies, joint industry projects, such as the one that was briefed this morning, but JIP 33, which is another major IOGP standardization project on procurement. Um, just recently, and I want to draw your attention to that second last bullet, fabrication site construction safety recommended practices. Uh, a new, and for this industry, probably not a very exciting topic, but a new topic that launched a different way of publishing IOGP guidance, because the recommended practice format was established in that document, and with the work that we're now doing to update the 
currently what's known as Report 590, the Aircraft Management Guidelines, to update that long-standard industry document. We're taking a lead from these fabrication site construction safety recommended practices. So, 590, you've, uh, you've heard of it. Uh, it actually has a very long history. It was originally 390 prior to that. Uh, and uh, it's been around for about 25, 30 years. It's a manual. It's uh, written in prose. Uh, it can be quite hard when you're reading the paragraphs within it to determine what the point is of any particular paragraph. You know, where is the, the requirement, the expectation? What's the performance goal in any particular part? So under Safira, we've got work to reissue 590. We're not going to uh, boil the ocean. We're starting very narrowly and very deliberately with uh, what's of most importance to people in this room, and that's helicopters operating offshore. So 590 has lots of guidance on operating aeroplanes, doing pipeline surveillance. We're keeping that out of scope in the initial phase. We'll move on to that in the future. To just give you a, a, a taste of the, the writing style that came out of that fabrication site guide, we want to remove the ambiguity that uh, has existed uh, with should and shall and must. There's been a lot of debate over the years uh, uh, between helicopter operators, oil and gas companies, around whether something is optional. So the recommended practice writing style is designed to try and strip out the ambiguity. Uh, and one of the ways it does that is it just makes objective statements in present tense. Um, one of the things we want to be able to do with that is then get all of the IOG members to align around these new recommended practices. And we know there are some differences in application between IOGP members, and that's a debate that has to happen within the IOGP. But that management committee has challenged us to uh, uh, really step up, get the words right, and then mention, describe where there are any differences. It's, it's quite possible we'll publish those differences so that as suppliers you'll be able to see them uh, in the public domain. That's, that's still uh, a subject of debate. And obviously, ultimately, they can be referenced directly from contracts at the moment. Uh, I administer within Shell a, a large Shell group of requirements for aircraft operations. They mirror the existing 590, but they're written with greater precision, I believe, than 590. Hopefully, this uh, new uh, recommended practice document will allow us to slim that right back and let there be an objective uh, industry document that we're referencing. So, where are we? The work group has um, uh, a dedicated, funded technical writer. Um, we have an existing work group structure, terms of reference, and a fairly aggressive pace. The uh, 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 three-year window is not one that we're going to entertain here. We're going to be working this at a much uh, faster tempo and cadence, to use the musical theme. Thank you. Um, so here's just an example. Please don't try and read these words. I'll give you a closer look on the next slides. These are drafts that are currently going through the working group process. And I just want to emphasize one thing about that work group. It was on an earlier slide. There are major um, uh, 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 IOGP members on that group, of course, but Heli Offshore is also directly represented on that group. And one of my biggest asks as we go through this process of drafting is to make sure that Heli Offshore is really giving us the high quality review that we need so that you're happy with the output. That's a, a major objective for us. But you can see in the structure of the documents, I'll bring one up now. This particular one is on duplicate inspections. As I say, this is not technically reviewed yet, so don't uh, hold this uh, to any in particular. But we'll have an extract from the safety performance model at the top to show you where it sits within Heli Offshore's broader strategy. Uh, there'll be purpose statements. There will be a control definition. Uh, and then you can just see in the language, which of course is not yet marked out with paragraph numbering, that'll all come once the document's published, but then there's just clear statements of what the objectives are for each, uh, each one. I'll give you another example here on automation, where it sits in the safety performance model, purpose, control, and then in clear statements that we believe would be entirely contractable. I'll use that term very deliberately. Um, they're recommended practices. Strictly speaking, it's not a standard. Uh, IOGP publishes guidance and recommended practices, but we believe it will be usable uh, uh, as a reference document from a contract. And there's one on accident survival goals, flight following. Same structure. 
So really, that's uh, what I wanted to do in terms of showing you the content. A little bit, very quickly, just on the governance process. Uh, in its oversight of the project, uh, the working group will be specifying the key existing 590 uh, controls to carry through as recommended practices. It will be a slimmer document, I'm sure of that. Uh, and for those, there's no material change from the current AMG. But we also want to identify those opportunities to update and improve the content. Uh, and there's a whole lot of pinch points, often in tables with numbers in them, that drive, I think, uh, almost any uh, operator in this room mad because of those differences. We do want to align around one common set of numbers. So recency after absence, equipment, fit, personal qualifications, those sorts of things uh, are going to be simplified and aligned around. And then, obviously, material changes. It's not just going to be reinventing what we've already got, the, uh, uh, really going after the things that matter, excellence where it counts. We want to identify those things that have been discussed this weekend, uh, like h 2 FCOM, flight path management, that will be the high priority areas for uh, recommended practices. And then the IOGP commitment there is to review and support those material changes during the drafting process. Heli Offshore has a role in that. That's the Aviation Subcommittee's job. Uh, but then at the Safety Committee, Management Committee le level, it's about alignment by the oil and gas company organizations themselves in the way they contract and procure services. That piece of work, we've seen very strong commitment from the top end of IOGP and our member companies to say that this is an area where we will standardize and simplify. Thank you. Uh, good morning all, and uh, for the introduction there, thanks, I'm David Anderson, I'm from the Flight Safety Foundation BARS program, I'll give you a bit of a, a perspective of what the onshore resource sector has achieved in this same sort of area. If there's any doubt as to my origins, I'm going to use the word data, not data. <laughs> so the role of data in safety standards. So the onshore resource sector, we go that way. Uh, contracting companies looked for a risk-orientated uh, standard with a data-driven model uh, to drive their safety. The BARS program commenced in 2010 on the desire of these contracting companies for a more efficient and robust method of aviation assurance and verification processes. We have a very wide uh, diversity of the program participants. We've got everything from Robinson 22s chasing cows in northwest Australia to wide body, uh, single eye passenger jets. We've got S92s, we've got a Diamond 44 doing geophysical survey. So the BARS program has a very wide audience of who's participating in the program, which gives us lots of data. This chart we're showing here is the onshore resource sector accident and uh, fatality rate, or sorry, accident and fatality count since 2007. What you can see there is both a dramatic decrease in the number of events uh, along with that uh, pre, uh, earlier uh, increase in the events around 2012. What it doesn't show is the 350 plus fatalities associated with those red bars. So it's a pretty significant accident uh, total that we've got to deal with here, but we've got some good results there. For me personally, and also all the people at the BARS program office, this is what motivates us for facilitating change in the onshore resource sector. Just like what your heli offshore community is doing here. Well done. So for my part of the conversation, I'd like to talk about communicating the benefit of new standards and how we go about using data in this effort. Don't get too hung up on the slide and the content there. This is the bar's bow tie. But it, it's a graphical depiction of the threats, controls, and defense measures within uh, the standard. But what we've done here is we've identified the hot spots uh, in the bow tie. It's a heat map, if you would like. So data is what helps us tell this story. Unfortunately, accident and causal factor data is a lagging indicator for what's going on. It's very much a rear view mirror perspective of what's happening. Very early in the life of the program, BARS undertook what we call a finding data analysis, or FDA. It takes a snapshot of where we are with the effectiveness of the various controls, and it's also a mechanism for identifying leading indicators for actual and potential control failures within the system. We can feed this back into the global industry, so thereby what we call a closed loop information 
and then we can all learn from the results there. So these are the, these are the high priority threats. So this data is the top 10 for 2012 through 2017. A critical element in this is the quality of the data. Having a consistent and alignment in the method of collecting the data, so for us that's the audit results, makes this a lot more accurate. The accuracy also assists in benchmarking, where, the, where you are now compared to three years ago or five years ago, for example. And we can look at the effectiveness for each one of those sets of controls. We can also break this data down into looking into country by country comparisons or a region or even looking at what are the impacts for a small operator versus a large operator, which is one of the more recent ones that we did. A more specific task here is uh, helicopter external load operations and the frequent barrier or the control failures that we've seen here. So this was finding data analysis number five that we did in 2016. So again, it graphically displays the audit identified control failures with external load operations. In this one, manoeuvre boundary envelope is the highest rate of non-conformity. But in-flight loss of control is a threat here. And you can see how there's alignment occurring in those control failures in there. So that's really an area where you can focus your energies on using the data that comes out of the audit program. So what we'll do in time, we'll do another follow-up and we'll just see how we can go about, or sorry, what is the impact of these uh, changes that we've made in the program. No doubt, once we combine this with the lagging indicator of event material, we get a much more stronger picture. But at the moment, we're looking at the leading indicators here. A second form of control weakness that we've identified through the program is repetitive findings. Controls that are subject to repeat findings time after time, even though it's been corrected through a non-conformity corrective action plan, and then it fails again. So what are the factors that are dealing with that? So again, through a consistent standard system and an audit program, you can identify that and then bring that material back to the audience. What we've seen in this one is, for information, uh, maintenance duty times, maintenance quality assurance and training aspects are the ones that come up the most often for repetitive findings in our audit program. Uh, the other one is emergency response plans also come up there. Uh, a new initiative we did for the version 7 of the BAR standard was to introduce uh, safety performance goals. That's the orange text associated with each one of those uh, controls there. We could see through data from the program that organisations were having trouble setting safety performance indicators. So what can we do to help them create better SPIs? So there's a safety call associated with each one of those controls and defences throughout the program, or throughout the standard, sorry. And it's designed to educate the reader on the why this particular control is in place. Trying to move people away from a compliance for the sake of compliance mentality to understand why is it there? Why do you want it there? And what's it supposed to be achieving? And then for the more astute, you can start turning that into an SPI. So we're not being prescriptive about SPIs, but we're giving you the tools to make the SPIs. So there's another one that we do in the program also is that we have a, generally called it, is alternative means of compliance. So for each, for some of the controls in the program, there is an AMC associated with that. And again, through the audit program, we can see and we can measure how many times that AMC is being used. And then what we do from the foundation is we take that back to the technical committee and say, maybe that control needs to be redesigned or rephrased or something like that, because if everybody's using the AMC, Maybe the control wasn't right in the first place. So we can do, use data to produce that material back to them. One of the things that's, uh, I'll just jump a bit forward there, but one of the things also that's relevant for this audience and your discussion about HTORs, but I can bring you some free advice if you want. Through the data from the audit program, we saw a 20% rate of non-conformity for aircraft operators not having SOPs associated with GPWS. So the aircraft were fitted with GPWS, but there were no SOPs on what to do with it. So 20% non-conformity rate was what we identified there. There was another 25% non-conformity rate for no training associated with EGPWS, or sorry, GPWS warnings. So again, these are leading indicators that that barrier or the control may not be effective or could be outright ineffective in practice. Something to be aware of there. So this last chart, shows you the data associated with the accident history and the time of the program and the introduction of the standard to the sector. 
The program's only just getting towards collection of flight hours, so this is not a rate. This is a list of the events associated with the program. And I know with this sector, you've done a lot of great work on collecting flight hours and, and being able to normalise it. We're only just starting down that path. And again, if you think back to that audience that we've got, the diversity in it, it's a real challenge for us. The two lines added to the chart show the number of accidents associated with the BARS, member, oh, sorry, BARS registered operators, that's the black line, and also the BARS member organisation. They're the contracting companies there. So all up there, the sharing of the data is critical to the sector improving, and we can see and measure the results associated with that. So summary-wise there. Having consistent and aligned standards will make will provide you with the basis of collecting good data. So there's your starting point there, is having those consistent and aligned standards. The mature systems will have and, and work with leading indicators rather than lagging indicators. I don't ignore the lagging ones, but the leading ones are the ones where you get the real gold out of it. The data must drive the standard development. As I mentioned there, there's a few different tools that you can use to get your, your standards really um, clean and neat and tidy there. Good quality data is absolutely critical to that. And then lastly, one, collective learning and collaboration is far better than doing it inside a silo. You'll, you'll improve much better and much quicker. So I hope you found it information uh, interesting and informative and happy to take questions at a later stage. Thanks a lot.